Okay, everyone, welcome this afternoon to a webinar being presented by USGS Ecosystems and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. This afternoon's webinar is one in a series of webinars being sponsored by USGS Ecosystems and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies on fish and wildlife health and disease topics. And today's webinar, we're going to look at assessing chronic wasting disease risk and leveraging new tools. Our speaker this afternoon will be Daniel Walsh, quantitative ecologist at the USGS National Wildlife Health Center. Um, but before we get started with the presentation, I did want to go over a couple housekeeping things just to let you know. First and foremost, today's uh, webinar is being recorded. The recording will be available after the webinar at the USGS Ecosystems Wildlife Health website, and we're also going to planning to post it on the AFWA website. So please feel free to reach out to either myself or Camille Harris at USGS if you'd like to access a copy of the recording. Um, second, we will be muting all of the lines except the speakers so we don't have extraneous noise. Uh, therefore, if you have a question during the webinar, there is a there chat is a box chat in box. the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and we ask that you type questions for the speaker in the chat box. When we reach the end of today's presentation, we'll review the questions in the chat box. I'll read them, and the speaker will then have an opportunity to respond to them. And if we finish the questions in the chat box and still have time left in the webinar uh, allotted time, we will open up the lines and then go to a more traditional Q&A type of format. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. We will try to hold this to a maximum of an hour out of respect of people's time today. And I look forward to a great presentation and some very interesting comments and questions for the speaker as well. And uh, I believe that Katie uh, may be on the line from the National Wildlife Health Center. Uh, my usual colleague Camille Harris from USGS is unfortunately unable to join us today, but I believe Katie is here and will be introducing today's speaker. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, Dan Walsh, uh, as already said, is a quantitative ecologist at the National Wildlife Health Center uh, located in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, he has a, a very great background. He started his uh, undergraduate degree at Michigan State, went on to a master's at Colorado State in fisheries and wildlife biology, and then went back to school to finish another master's in applied statistics as well as a PhD in fisheries and wildlife biology at Michigan State. Um, he has uh, a lot of very different interests, um, but mostly focusing on population okay. dynamics and spatial it's statistics, epidemiology, um, looking at stuff like bighorn sheep and chronic wasting disease and other ungulate diseases, um, as well as really thinking a lot about um, sort of model-driven um, surveillance designs. He's a really experienced um, and quite decorated statistician as well as ecologist, so he kind of brings those two fields together. Um, it's definitely my pleasure today uh, to introduce him, and, and I hope you really enjoy his talk on um, chronic wasting disease. So Dan, with that, I'll let you take it. Great. And we're going to mute the lines here and then bring Dan back up. So hold on one second. The conference has been muted. Dan, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. All right, excellent. Well, thanks, Katie, for the introduction, and I, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Um, I was asked to discuss a couple of research projects on which I've been working related to assessing the risk of prion diseases, including CWD, on wildlife populations. Um, the first project I'm going to discuss involves using genetic tools to assess the potential risk of prion diseases to bighorn sheep populations and to look for evidence of historical selective pressures of prion diseases on this species. Ne next slide. So this work is built or based on uh, work done by Morawski et al. in 2013, where they conducted an in vitro conversion assay where they demonstrated the prion protein of bighorn sheep could be converted to the misfolded isomer form when it was seeded with either uh, prions from CWD or scrapie. Additionally, the authors genotyped the prion gene of 20-some bighorn sheep from Washington and uh, looked through GenBank and found that it aligned with the ARQ um, genotype of domestic sheep, which is known to be scrapie susceptible. So based on, based on those findings, they suggested that there's definitely a risk for prion diseases to bighorn sheep. So our goal was to, to kind of expand on that, on that project and, and look at it with a much, across a much broader range, um, including subspecies in different populations, to assess the diversity of the prion protein gene uh, in big, bighorn sheep and to look for evidence of selective pressures, past selective pressures of prion disease on bighorn sheep. Next slide. 
So this is possible um, due, with a, due to a great network of collaborators, including Dr. Perry Wolf, Dr. Tom Stevenson, Dr. Matt Aldridge, as well as um, my USGS collaborators, Dr. Christina Carlson, Jay Snyder, and, and, and Dr. Chris Johnson. And with these collabor collaborators, we were able to collect quite a large sample set of um, uh, whole blood samples from, from individual bighorn sheep during either research or management activities. And these included um, samples from Rocky Mountain, California, Sierra Nevada, and desert subspecies of sheep. And what we did was we sequenced the prion protein gene, and we were particularly interested in looking at several amino acid sites, namely the 136, 154, and 171 regions, um, which are known to have polymorphisms in domestic sheep that affect the individual's susceptibility to scrapies. So these were good places to start and look, look for um, potential uh, selection pressures of prion diseases on big horns. Next slide. So our methods were, were quite straightforward, what you do with any kind of genotyping. We took our whole blood samples, uh, we did a DNA, uh, genomic DNA extract, extraction using standard kits, and then took the extracted material, ran them through an agarose gel to confirm that there was enough gen genetic material to allow for sequencing. And then we send them to a, typer, or to a uh, company called GeneTyper, um, which does a lot of our CWD sequencing for us, and they, they did the actual PCR ampl amplification and sequencing, and then sent us the raw data back. And then we employed a laser gene software as well as um, Clustal W2 software to do the actual alignments and compare the, the gene sequences between individuals and, and look at differences among populations as well as subspecies. And also we compared them to other sequences of a couple different species we'll talk about in a minute that were available uh, in GenBank. Next slide. So our results. Um, we were able to actually sequenced 226 individual bighorn sheep samples. Um, that included 61 Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, 27 California, 31 Sierra Nevada, and 107 desert bighorns. And what was surprising, uh, or at least seems surprising, is that we, we did not find a single difference. Um, that these, 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 all these sequences across all individuals, populations, subspecies were homologous. And that was not only at the amino acid level, but also the nucleotide level. So there's no, there no silent mutations, uh, or a silent mutation is where there's a, a, a different nucleotide, but it still codes for the same amino acid. So even at the, at the SNP level, there was, a, there was, was no uh, uh, difference across any of these groups of, of bighorns or individuals. So then we took our consensus sequence and went to GenBank and said, okay, let's look at what, what's already in there for bighorn sheep and compare it to what we found, as well as look at doll sheep and the domestic sheep ARQ, uh, which um, had been compared previously. And also we wanted to look at mouflon in particular because those are, that's the species that are believed to be the ancestor of both the domestic sheep as well as the bighorns and doll sheep. And once again, we found complete homologous. Uh, everything lined up exactly the same. Next slide. And so here's an example of the uh, alignment at the amino acid level. I'm not going to show you the nucleotide level because to, to, it's too hard to see. Um, but basically what the red arrows are pointing to is that where all these little asterisks or stars are means that the, that, that the amino acids align across these different species. Um, and what we see is basically perfect alignment um, across all these different, different groups. Next slide. So, so what does this mean? What did, what did we learn by doing all this? Well, it's pretty clear there doesn't seem to be any evidence, at least for, from the, the populations and subspecies that we sampled, that there's been selective pressure historically for prion diseases. This prion protein gene is, conserved, is highly conserved, not only among individuals and populations, but across subspecies, and, and arguably even evolutionary time when you look at the MUFONs. So we know that CWD and scrapie occur on the range. Um, so why didn't we see, see any, any uh, uh, selective pressure or any evidence of that in any way? It's possible there actually hasn't been any real exposure um, at any population type level, or it could be that maybe there's some physiological, anatomical, um, or even environmental barriers that are, that are preventing um, bighorn sheep, if they are being exposed, um, to, to actually acquiring the prion diseases. Um, however, given that MUFON and the ARQ domestic sheep are known to be susceptible to scrapie, and given the results from the in vitro assay done previously, it seems likely that if bighorn sheep are are exposed on the range to either CWD or scrapie, you're likely not to have any, will not, likely not have any resistance. Um, and, and that this risk of these TS, uh, pre prion diseases um, occurs across the range, given the, the level of the number of uh, subspecies and populations that we looked at. So what does this mean from a management perspective? 
I think that it reinforces a lot of the work that's been done recently on, on developing these best management practices for separating, say, domestic sheep and bighorn sheep to prevent the transmission of respiratory disease. It seems like this provides an additional incentive to do that to try to prevent any potential transmission, particularly of scrapie, to the domestic sheep, given the level of risk. So that's kind of a, a summary of, of the first study. Uh, next slide. The second study I'm going to talk about is actually going to go down a completely different vein, and this is a, I'm going to talk about a web application that I developed for conducting weighted surveillance for chronic wasting disease. So weighted surveillance is not a new idea, um, but it, but it, um, it it's based on or its purpose is to try to detect new CWD foci in the landscape, and it's a very simple idea underlying it, and it's that we know that the disease does not act uniformly across the population, and that includes chronic wasting disease that typically there's heterogeneity either in individuals or demographic groups within a population. And so what the weighted surveillance idea does is can we exploit and take advantage of those, those differences and look at the most, the, group, the demographic groups most at risk to try and find the disease as quick as possible if it's present on the landscape. It does require there has to be historical data or information available because you need to know how, you need to be able to, to look at and identify those heterogeneities within dif different demographic groups um, within a population. Next slide. So how does it work? So when we're trying to detect CWD, the, prin the principle is to focus your surveillance on the most at-risk groups. For this example, for example, or for this, for this disease, we know adult males tend to always have higher prevalence rates um, th th than adult females, at least for the most part. And so we know that that group is, is more at risk. So let's focus our, our detection surveillance efforts on the groups most likely to have the disease. It just makes sense. And if we do that, it should improve the effectiveness and efficiency of our surveillance program, and we should be able to find the disease not only faster but at a cheaper cost. So how do we actually employ this? Well, as I mentioned, it requires historical data. We need to be able to estimate those weights. And what do I mean by weights? Well, weights are basically just an index or a measure of the amount of information a sample entering your surveillance stream from a particular demographic group provides relative to some baseline group. And from here on out, because we're going to be talking about white-tailed deer uh, CWD surveillance, uh, we're going to assume that year harvested yearly males are a baseline group. So this group, uh, so that means that this group has a weight assigned to be one, and all other groups are scaled relative to that. So, for example, if a group, say adult males, has a higher weight than one, that means there's more information regarding the presence of CWD in the landscape um, when you look at a, an adult male than if you look at a, at a yearly male. And then if it's lower than one, the opposite is true. And so basically how the, the surveillance program actually works then is that you, as individuals enter your surveillance stream, you assign them to a particular demographic group, which then assigns them a certain number of points, which is based on the weight value estimated. And you continue to accumulate points until you reach some target value, and then you stop your surveillance. Next slide. So how do you determine your target value? Well, this is something that you specify when you design your surveillance program. And typically, a common way to do it, or common uh, design specification is to say, I want a 95% confidence of detecting at least one case in my baseline group, which is the harvested yearly males, if the prevalence in that group is, say, 1%. So basically what happens is you continue to collect samples until you reach that target value, which, which is um, determined by the, the simple probabilistic statement. And I, and I provided here a, a screenshot of, of a link to one of the publications. This is the uh, lead author on this, this is Dennis Heisey, um, which provides a good the, uh, description of, of the weighted surveillance and then kind of the theoretical underpinning and the statistical methods that this application um, employs. So I just want to take, a, take that time to give a brief introduction to, to weighted surveillance, if you're not familiar with it. Next slide. So the problem is that this, this stuff's been around for a little bit, but it really doesn't seem to, be, to have been widely applied. Uh, and given all the you know, more recent detections of CWD in, in areas um, more recently, I think the problem why it has not been applied is that the statistical methods are, are relatively inaccessible, and there's an absence of, this, of a user-friendly tool to, to, to employ a weighted surveillance program. Next slide. So the solution I came up was with, with was let's develop an easy-to-use web application that, underlying it, harnesses the, the power of the statistical program R for actually doing the analysis, but the user never has to see that or deal with that. Rather, there's, there's just this user-friendly inter, uh, user interface um, via Shiny, uh, which is a, uh, builds off of the R package, to provide the, the, this interface. 
And so the current version that I'm going to demonstrate for you now is, is set up strictly for white-tailed deer, deer. And the weights, as I mentioned, we need historical data. So the weights are based on um, data estimated for Wisconsin, the CWD surveillance program in their endemic area. And as I mentioned before, for this, for this, for this um, application, we're assuming that our baseline group is harvested yearly males. Next slide. So the, to, to find the web application, it's being hosted on the POPR website at the University of Montana, and the URL is provided here. So if we go to that, next slide. Uh, POPR has a lot of useful tools for managers, of, for, particularly for population demographics. Um, but if I've circled in red, it, there's this paw print for CWD monitoring, and that's where our, our web application for weighted surveillance is. So if you click on that, next slide. It brings up basically our weighted surveillance uh, introduction page. And so the first tab is basically just provides a useful sets of links to the idea of the weighted surveillance, um, some of the statistical methods, the programs being used, um, and just provides a good background for starting out when you're doing weighted surveillance. The second tab is the design tab, which is what the red arrow points to. And if we click on that, next page, it brings up this, this, uh, this uh, tab or this page. And what this is, is we use this, and this is where you're going to start doing your work. So if you're wanting to design a weighted surveillance program, or if you have a weighted surveillance program ongoing and you want to track how close you are to your target value, you would use this page. And I know it's a little bit hard to see, so we'll zoom in on this. So next, next slide. We look here at the top left corner, and this is where you, you start out. And this is where you specify basically the parameters of your surveillance program. You specify the confidence level, the prevalence that you want to detect in your harvested yearly males or baseline group, and the sensitivity of your diagnostic test that you'll be using. So in this example, I'm saying I want a 95% confidence of detecting a 1% prevalence in harvested yearly males and that my test sensitivity is 1. So this makes sense, for example, if I'm using a lot of harvested animals where I'm collecting lymph nodes and doing IHC on it, um, the test sensitivity should be very, very high. Um, however, sometimes you may be working with, with, you can't do harvest and you're relying on live sampled a, am, animals and something like RALMO um, to, to determine whether or not disease is present in an individual. Well, that has a much lower sensitivity and you need to account for that in order to make sure that you reach your, your confidence level. Um, so it'll require more samples the lower your sensitivity is. So once you specify that, next slide. You can look to the top right of the, uh, the web page and you see there's three basically dynamic outputs. The first one's the target number of points. So this is how many points you need to, to, to accumulate in order to achieve your goal. Uh, in this case, it's 95% confidence of a 1% prevalence in of detecting at least one case of the prevalence in yearly males, harvested yearly males is 1%. The second output is how many points you've collected so far towards your surveillance program. Right now it's zero. And then the third one is how, how many more points do you need? So this is where you get to play, play around with, um, with designing your program or tracking uh, where you're at within, if you already have a program ongoing. Next slide. At the bottom is where you actually, the user actually starts playing around with different sample sizes from very di various different demographic groups. And there's, there's three different classes, and I'm pointing the, the red arrows to the two other classes. The main one here shown is the hunter harvested one. The second class is sharpshooter animals. So if you have sharpshooters out there collecting samples for you, uh, you enter them in, under that tab. And then there's the other sources tab which includes things like roadkill deer or animals that report it sick, um, those type, types, types of uh, sample sources. But let's, I'm just going to show you the hunter harvested one here. It looks exactly the same for the, uh, for the other uh, classes. And if we zoom in on just the hunter harvested adult males, what you see is it's just a simple slider system. And as you slide that slider to different sample sizes, it dynamically updates how many points you, you've accumulated and how many points you need. Next slide. So here's an example where, uh, let's say I have an, an ongoing program and I've collected 33 hunter harvested adult males, 24 adult females, and 37 hunter harvested yearling males. And the output on the top shows that my target remains the same because that's what I'm shooting for, but the points I've collected is, is 175. So that's based on the underlying weights, which you can't see, but it's being, being calculated underneath. Um, the weights that we estimated from the Wisconsin CWD data. So that's the, 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 the different information from each of the various uh, demographic class. So hunter harvested adult males are worth more than the, the, the yearling males, for example. And you can also see that I need 123 points still in order to, to reach my goal. Next slide. And eventually, as your samples in your surveillance stream, you may exceed your goal, and it tells you, congratulations, you've reached it, and, and tells you how far over you've gone.
we can see that we can play around with this really dynamically um, when, you, when you're designing a program and say, okay, I, th I think I can only get probably 30 adult males, but maybe I can get a lot more yearling males, so how many females do I need? Um, those types of questions. Or just track with you, where you're at in your surveillance program. So that's the design tab. Next slide. There's also, I guess, one last thing is you can e export the re results. So if you're designing a surveillance program and you've got to set it up exactly the way you want it, you click the export results button. Next slide. And it sends it out as a CSV file, um, which you can read in almost any program, including Excel, as, showed, as shown here. Next, next slide. The last tab is the estimation tab. And this, so this is the tab that you use once you've basically, maybe you finished for the year your, your surveillance, you've got the number of samples, and you want to know now what, 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 what was the actual prevalence rate I could have detected given my sampling effort. And this is important because a lot of times you don't actually reach that target goal, or maybe you exceed it, and you want to you want to get credit for that basically. So this is a tab where you do that, and it's set up very similar to the design tab. And at the bottom, next slide, you can see that we ha have the same three little tabs there for the different classes: the hunter harvest, the sharpshooter, and the other sources. Um, and now, if we if you look at the top, we can see where we zoomed in. Instead of a slider, you just enter in, the, enter in the number of samples you got from each of the demo various demographic groups. If you didn't get in any samples from, from, those, from that group, you just leave it as zero. Next, next slide. So at that point, you can actually estimate your latent prevalence rates, rates and it will just use all the default values. But I've built in some, some, um, some flexibility so you, you can specify some different options with how, how the model actually runs if you so desire it. So if you're, what's, under, what's underlying this and estimating these latent prevalence rates is a, is a Bayesian statistical model that's doing it, uh, for those of you who are familiar with an MCMC analysis. So at the top right, there's what is kind of my model input section. And next slide. If you click on it, there's, there's an MCMC options button. So those of you who are familiar with Bayesian analysis, next slide. You can click that button, and in this, you can specify the number of chains that you want to use, the number of repetitions or length of the chain, as well as your burn-in. Next slide. You also There's also an option to choose plots. Next slide. And what this is, this allows you to select various diagnostic plots that you want to, want to look at to see if there's any evidence for non-convergence of your MCMG chains. So this includes density plots, trace plots, and, and autocorrelation plots. And I will say that if you select this, and then you go to look at them, it does take a little while and it, and it takes a little bit longer to, to, to run the analysis. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not worth looking at, it just takes a little bit longer. Next slide. There's also, the next uh, option is the monitors um, button, so if you click that, next slide. Uh, these are all the, all the different demographic cl classes that are available um, on those three tabs on the bottom. And so by default, what the app will do was it'll provide latent prevalence estimates for only those for which you actually collected samples. Um, but perhaps you may want to look at some other, uh, look, look what the latent prevalence rates might be in some of the other groups. Um, and so you can do that by either selecting all of them or selecting some subset, um, whatever, you, whatever you wish. Next slide. The final tab is actually the diagnostic test tab. And this was something some of the collaborators asked me to add in. And this allows you to specify different diagnostic test characteristics, that being sensitivity and specificity, for uh, different groups, uh, different demographic groups entering your surveillance stream. Next, next slide. The way this works is you click the diagnostic plot or diagnostic test button, and it asks you how many uh, new, unique number of diagnostic tests were used in your surveillance. So in this example, we'll say two. Next slide. And then ask you to assign the diagnostic test to each of the demographic groups. So in this example, the first three groups um, were, were tested using diagnostic test two, and the rest were, used, uh, were tested using diagnostic test one. When you submit that, next slide. And now this is where you actually specify that sensitivity and specificity for each test. And I'm just going to show you the sensitivity for test one. It's the same cross sensitivities and specificities, the same options. So if you click on test one button, next, next slide. You can see there's three different ways that you can specify your test sensitivity. You can use the default values, next slide. Next slide. And what this does is it just basically takes the values for um, IHC and lymph nodes um, from the literature and uses that to, to um, provide the, the underlying probability distribution. And that's what this message is telling you. Next slide. But perhaps you might have your own data for, for, for testing sensitivity and specificity, or you have other literature that you want, you want to use. 
um, you can use your you click the use data button next slide and then you can specify from the literature the number of true positive cases and the number of false negative cases uh, which will define your sensitivity for, for test one next slide but perhaps you don't have any information um, and but you, you have somebody's expert opinion. Uh, somebody in the diagnostic uh, lab or something has a good idea, but they don't, they don't have it formally validated the test. Um, you can actually, if you click the quantiles button, this allows you to use expert opinion to generate um, the sensitivity of your test. So if you click that button, next slide, it allows you to specify the mean sensitivity and then basically put a credible bound around that, 95% credible bound around it. So you can say, I think that it's 85% and that if there's a 95% probability the sensitivity falls between 75 and 99%. Um, and then if you click the test my input button after you specified that, next slide, it displays the actual distribution that you just elicited. Um, and if you don't like it, you can go back and change it um, to, to match something that, that's more uh, aligned with what, in line with what you were thinking. Next slide. So once you've, you've specified your sensitivity, you do that for each of the tests and do the same thing for specificity and then you can just click the done button, next slide. And then you're ready to estimate and there's a big aqua green button there on the top right, you click that, next slide. And it provides this result, next slide. So we zoom in on the results, it basically provides two tables. It's uh, a summary of the posterior distribution to the actual latent prevalence rates for each of the, the um, demographic classes you monitored that includes the mean, the standard deviation, and then a series of quantiles, as well as the number of iterations, so how, many, how long each of the chains were run. And then on the bottom, it provides a summary of the data that was entered, so your sample size for each group, your mean sensitivity and specificity that was used, and what method was used to um, specify the diagnostic characteristics of sensitivity and specificity. And so if we look at the results in, in this example, um, a lot of times we, we're talking about this 95% confidence um, so we look at the 95% upper quantile, the, the or upper credible bound, the 95% uh, quantile. And so, for example, for this hunter harvested adult females, it, we look at that and we see it's 5%. Five, 5 so that means that we're given our sampling effort in this example, we're 95% confident that we would detect at least one case if the prevalence is 5% or greater. Or an alternative explanation, if you're thinking in terms of uh, the actual latent prevalence, that there's a 95% probability that the latent uh, prevalence rate is less than 5%. Next slide. So there's a couple options too here for model outputs. Um, the first one is display plots. So that I'm not going to show that today just for time's sake, but if you specified in the input section that you want a diagnostic plot, you click that button and then you click which plot you want to display. Like I said, it might take a little bit to generate them, just be patient. Um, and then it'll display the plots and you, you can download those as JPEG files and save them for a publication or something like that if you're interested in it. Um, next slide. On the right hand side there's an understand results button and I put this in to try and help provide some layman terms for what, what the values actually mean. Next slide. So if you click that, there's a written description for the baseline or harvest early manual cl class describing what the 95% uh, uh, confidence means in, in relation to the results reported in the table. So that's just to try and help, help folks understand what, the, what this actually means. Next slide. And then lastly, you can export your results. Next slide. You click that button and it, once again it comes out as a CSV file that you can open in Excel and you have and it provides the posterior estimates in a spreadsheet. Next, next slide. And then there's a help button. You click that and it just provides the information on how to use the estimation page, um, the various model inputs and outputs, how to, how to specify those, um, so on and so forth. Next slide. So, so that's it. So that's a, it's a web application. I'm, I'm hoping that you know folks that, that are doing CWD surveillance or thinking about doing CWD surveillance, this will be useful for them um, to try trying to implement um, this, this weighted surveillance idea and, and try to make use of the information that we've learned about CWD with regard to in, individual heterogeneity and risk. Um, so once again, the website for that um, application is there on the bottom. Feel free to play around with it, use it. Um, we can. Uh, Next slide. My email is here. You, you know, you can let me know what you think. If there's things that that, that aren't working, if it breaks, let me know. But are, 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 if there's things that you'd like to see maybe a little differently or add-ons, um, we, we can look at those as well. So, with that, uh, um, I think I'll, I'll call it call it a day. And uh, appreciate your your time and taking the time to to listen listen to our, our research projects. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, we do have one question that's come in in the chat box. 
Um, it's from Wayne LaRoche, and he, the question has to do with sample size. I believe this is in the tool. And the question is, does the sample size not depend on population size? So the way we've got it set up currently is for most, and I'm thinking about this in terms of, say, white-tailed deer population out east, most of the time the populations are so large that it doesn't make any uh, difference whether or not you use a finite population correction factor. So I haven't built that in currently. Now, it's something that we could potentially add um, to this if you're dealing with really small populations, but you get, you get over a couple hundred, um, even a thousand, and, it, and it, really, it really has minimal effect on it. So, um, so that's, that's why it doesn't necessarily um, depend uh, on, on the uh, population size. It's just because generally we're dealing with such large populations that it, it doesn't really affect the sample size calculations. We're, we're basically assuming an infinite population. Great, thank you. Question here from Christian Schuler. Can you give us the weights calculated for Wisconsin, and are those able to be changed in the model? So, so the so the first question is um, is actually we've got a manuscript that uh, Christian L's the lead on that uh, should be submitted here shortly, which those will be all then provided. Um, so until those are until that's out, I um, told him I wouldn't I wouldn't give out the weights, but. Um, uh, you could you could kind of play around and get a good uh, figure out relatively close to what they are. But once that what's that, that that's out, that's obviously can be pro provided. Um, I don't provide don't allow you to change the weights in this. It's something that um, we could talk about and probably be on more on an individual basis um, because it, there's a the, the weights right now are being estimated from a whole lot of, of data from Wisconsin, some, some very good surveillance data, um, and it, I think those provide a very good basis. But if you've got your own data and your own from your own surveillance program where you, where you know you have CWD and you're able to estimate those those risk factors, um, those, that heterogeneity and risk factors, yeah, you, you could use your own weights. Um, but I haven't built that in that capability in um, currently to, to the application. Great, thank you very much, Dan. That's the last question we had in the comment box. So what I'm going to do now, recognizing that we still have a bit of time is to unmute the line, so everyone's going to be unmuted here in just a second, and then we can move to a more traditional question and answer format, and so I'm going to unmute the lines at this point. The conference has been unmuted. And the lines are now live, so please feel free to ask a question, just state your name, and then your question for Dan if you have a question at this point. Thank you. Question for Hello. Chris Shaden in Ontario. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks. What would the uh, effect of the hunter versus sharpshooter uh, variable, the button that was green, how would that impact the, the model? So it's going to depend on the demographic class. So I didn't show it here just for time sake, but you'll, if you click on the sharpshooter um, button or tab, it has exactly the same demographic class. It's the same six demographics, the adult males, females, yearly males, young females, and uh, male fawns and female fawns. And so the, the weights for each of those, for those various classes differ between hunter harvest and, and, and those collected by sharpshooters. Sometimes not much, sometimes a little bit. Um, and, that's, and it's not necessarily clear on why that is. Um, somebody else had a question about that. And one potential um, reason that the weights might be different is that um, I believe a lot of sharpshooting was done in the winter over bait, and so maybe there's a depending on which way the weights go, if they're more higher in the sharpshooting class, which was what the original question was um, with other person. Um, the reason why that was higher, potentially could be higher, is that uh, perhaps the infected individuals being in poor body conditions were more likely to come to the bait and, and be harvested um, by not harvested, but be collected by the um, or called by the sharpshooters. So the reason why we put in two different groups is because there's actually different weight estimates for those, and they're, they're not necessarily the same for each demographic class, whether it was, depending on whether it was hunter harvested or if it's collected by sharpshooters. Great, thank you. Other questions? So I have a question. This is Maria from North Carolina, and maybe you mentioned something about this, but I was wondering. Uh, what is the impact of the geographic distribution of these samples? Is that weighed in as well? So in, in the original stuff we did um, for mule deer in Colorado, we didn't include a spatial component. 
<clears throat> but it, but in this in in the white tail uh, deer weights um, that that uh, Dr. Christian L. Connect collected uh, or uh, estimated, he did include a spatial component. So it was uh, what they call a car model, which allows for um, basically accounts for spatial autocorrelation. So samples are, are really close to, um, together. It accounts for that that fact. Um, but I think that it's one of the areas where there's probably there is still a need for more development in the weighted weighted surveillance piece in the sense of um, if you if you know where an outbreak is is occurring right now you, it doesn't really give you any credit for the fact that you're close to that outbreak right so if you're getting sample samples from, from high risk demographic groups close to an outbreak those should be worth more than animals quite a quite a distance from the outbreak right now the weighted surveillance program doesn't um, or the surveillance uh, design does not uh, account for that but um, that doesn't but I guess I would argue that that's also the case for, for, for the typical surveillance program. You, you, uh, there is no real accounting for it. And, and the difference is that in the, in the typical kind of standard um, surveillance um, programs or designs, are you basically assume everybody has a weight of one. What we've done is just go back and say, well, no, that's not true. Let's look at what we know about CWDs and the ecology and, and the heterogeneity we see between these different demographic groups and use that information to help us improve surveillance. So you could take your weighted surveillance program and, and say, let's say, let's say you have, you're adjacent to a state that has CWD. You could focus your, your weighted surveillance program on that border, for example. And though even though it's not formally accounted for, because you're focusing your efforts at the higher spatial risk area, you've done it in an informal way. But I think that's that's definitely one of the areas where I think there's a, there's a, a good uh, would be a good place to do some more development is, is bringing in the spatial aspects of, of the disease on the landscape where you know it is and accounting for that. Great, thank you. Other questions? Dan, this is Kristen Schuler again. Um, I just uh, some of our surveillance numbers into the estimation calculator tab and unfortunately everything I get is zeros from that I think because the sample sizes are a bit larger than what the estimate estimates would be for the points is there a way to get those to stretch out so you can see smaller numbers sure actually I, I yeah I, initially it was just trying to yeah that's a good point I, I didn't these are, this is why you have people use it right um, yeah we can definitely add some more significant digits to that um, so that you can see it. Yeah, that's that's what's happening is, is that it's going to basically it's going to show it goes it's right now it's at two two significant digits. Mm -hmm. um, that's an easy fix. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? If he's saying like we have agricultural damage habitual versus non right? Any other questions for Dan? Great. Well, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank you on behalf of AFWA and USGS Ecosystems for participating in the webinar this afternoon. I'd especially like to thank Dan Walsh for sharing this very interesting information with us. And as a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and it will be posted on the USGS Ecosystems website. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is one in a series of webinars about fish and wildlife health topics. If you have a particular topic you'd like to see covered, please feel free to reach out to myself. I'm Jonathan Maudsley, the Science Advisor at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, or to Camille Harris at uh, USGS Ecosystems, and we will do our best to accommodate requests. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to all of our partners who were able to participate in today's webinar. So uh, this concludes our webinar this afternoon. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks.